Who says things get slow in August? We journey to Ferguson, Missouri, Mount Sinjar, Iraq, and into the heart of American politics, tonight on Washington Week. Last week, you would have guessed this was Gaza. This week, it was the streets of a Midwestern town. This is a place where people work, go to school, their families, go to church, a diverse community, a Missouri community. But lately, it's looked a little bit more like a war zone. The spark? The police shooting death of an unarmed black teenager. I need justice for my son. The accelerant, the police response, with local, state, and federal officials on the spot. Put simply, we all need to hold ourselves to a high standard, uh, particularly those of us in positions of authority. In Iraq, the news was relatively good. Refugees rescued from Mount Sinjar, as a divisive leader finally agrees to step down. Back at home, a little recreational Hillary watching. Can I hug it out, Mr. President? Absolutely. Is she really trying to distance herself from the president she once served? Covering the week, Carrie Johnson, justice correspondent for NPR. Yoki Driesen, managing editor of Foreign Policy magazine. And Jeff Zeleny, senior Washington correspondent for ABC News. Award-winning reporting and analysis. Covering history as it happens. Live from our nation's capital, this is Washington Week with Gwen Ifill. Once again, live from Washington, moderator Gwen Ifill. Good evening. It has been hard to look away from the images in Ferguson, Missouri, from the still shots of Michael Brown lying dead in the street to the violent protest that followed to the cautious, angry truce that emerged afterward. But what was the government's role supposed to be? The Justice Department has launched its own investigation, and the president weighed in as well. There is never an excuse for violence against police or for those who would use this tragedy as a cover for vandalism or looting. There's also no excuse for police to use excessive force against peaceful protests or to throw protesters in jail for lawfully exercising their First Amendment rights. The state highway patrol captain now in charge outlined the dilemma on the ground today. I agree that this is not a black and white issue because we all have sons and daughters. And we do need to communicate better. The governor talked about old wounds. This is an old wound. But we, it's time to stop saying it's an old wound and close it for good. But what can the federal government really do to get to the bottom of a painful and confusing episode that has resonated across the country, Carrie? The federal government's role here, Gwen, is limited. As you may know, murder is a local crime, usually, usually prosecuted locally. And so the Justice Department can intervene in certain cases. For instance, if a federal worker is killed on the job or if a murder occurs on federal land. Here there's a special hook because uh, the law gives the Justice Department a special power to go in if a police officer acting in the line of duty may have violated the civil rights of an individual. And that's what Eric Holder at the Justice Department is looking at here. When did the Justice Department decide in this whole process as this was unfolding that they had to get involved or at least say they were going to get involved? They let people know as early as Monday, a couple of days after the killing of uh, the unarmed black teenager Michael Brown, that they were looking at this. But when calls from the street in Ferguson have grown throughout the week because people there have so little confidence in the state and local authorities, or at least they did for four or five days. So what the attorney general wound up having to do later in the week is spell out in very explicit terms what exactly he was doing, not just interview, uh, sending investigators to interview eyewitnesses to the killing of Michael Brown, but also sending mediators into the community, mediators from a special program DOJ had set up in the civil rights struggles of the 1960s to help go into the South to defuse tensions there. there they're on the ground now. And finally, uh, the Justice Department has made available advisors to the local police to help them with crowd control because obviously uh, protests got very violent in some instances and out of hand as the, the local armed forces were overly militaristic in the streets of Ferguson. 
I mean, this also has created so many strange bedfellows here. I mean, we saw President Obama speaking out um, on this, and I was struck by the first time he spoke out in a, a racial incident. He was criticized so much back with uh, Henry Gates in his first term, and then he did it again in a Trayvon Martin. But in this case, he seemed to actually be um, having an effect here. But then we also see Rand Paul on the other side, a Republican senator of Kentucky. What did you make of all the different? Frankly speaking, uh, far more toughly about the racial component. Without question. Yeah, we're in the middle of a conversation, Jeff, not just here in Washington, but all over the country, about uh, the criminal justice system and disparities in the criminal justice system. Rand Paul, in an essay in Time magazine this week, went all the way there. He said he would be treated differently um, if he were on the street and told by a police officer to move along and get out of the street. He would not expect it all to be the subject of violence, as this young man, Michael Brown, was. Uh, they also have come together, politicians from left and right, around this issue of big government and federal funding for some of these uh, technologies and techniques, the notion that there are armored vehicles that have been provided to the Ferguson police and the St. Louis County Police Force, the SWAT team gear, some of the tear gas and rubber bullets that we saw exploding in the streets of Ferguson this week. And some members protests. of Congress have said that they're going to look into that, actually, all these, uh, these uh, militarizations of these local police forces. Absolutely. Not just Rand Paul and Ted Cruz, the Republican from Texas, also a Tea Party favorite, but also Carl Levin, Democrat from Michigan, who runs the Senate Armed Services Committee, and Hank Johnson, a Georgia Democrat, has already said he's going to introduce legislation on these issues when Congress comes back to town. Okay, I spent some time living in Iraq, and it was common there to see sniper rifles, to see armored vehicles. It was shocking. I think not just in America. You had today the uh, Grand Ayatollah of Iran tweeting out about Ferguson, which was kind of shocking. Is it too late, though, to get these weapons out of the hands of the police? Well, uh, obviously, there are lots and lots of, of weapons uh, already in the hands of state and local forces all over the country. I think the issue is controlling the circumstances under which they are trained to use those weapons. And people, for instance, at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund are calling on the Justice Department to in institute new requirements for training local forces in how to do this. And, Yoki, you know, even more important is how to get out into the community itself and forge relationships so that when something bad happens, you have trust in the community. What we saw Ron Johnson, the highway patrol captain, doing was going out into the streets of Ferguson this week and hugging people and letting him know, letting them know that he was from there and but having a rapport with the community. There seem to be several different layers of investigation going on now. We, the, the, the actual investigation of the shooting is still in the hands of the St. Louis County cops. The, uh, th as you mentioned, Ron Johnson, the, the the highway patrol guy who's put in charge of kind of community policing piece of this. And then the FBI said there's going to be a parallel investigation. And how unusual is there is it for there to be a parallel federal investigation for a local, a local crime or alleged crime? It is unusual, but it happens in cases where um, there's been a case of abuse and civil rights allegations. In essence, what the FBI and civil rights investigators at the Justice Department are doing is looking over the shoulder at the conduct of the local force. And that's a special role for the federal government to play, one that goes all the way back to the Rodney King incident in California and James years Bird, ago. I remember. But let me ask you this, is there, we saw John Lewis, congressman from, from Georgia, civil rights icon, say, martial law, call for martial law, which surprised me a little bit. Is that un even possible? Well, uh, John Lewis, Congressman John Lewis, a veteran of the civil rights struggles in the 60s, wanted President Obama to call out the National Guard uh, to relieve the Ferguson police and the St. Louis County police because they had been doing such a mishandled job of dealing with crowd control and there was so much mistrust. It is unusual. Uh, I'm told by the Justice Department officials they never for one moment considered that happening uh, or considered that as an option because what they wanted to do here, Gwen, is demilitarize the situation, defuse the situation, and try to focus on the fact that in Ferguson, the police force of 50-odd people has two or three African-American officers. And that's something that Eric Holder at the Justice Department says needs to be a subject of conversation moving forward. It's funny, you used the term demilitarization. We sat at this table last week talking about demilitarizing Gaza. So all of a sudden now we're talking about demilitarizing an American city. So now let's move to Iraq. 
Two significant developments this week. The humanitarian crisis atop Mount Sinjar has eased, aided perhaps by U.S. airstrikes. And Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki finally saw the political handwriting on the wall and agreed to hand over the reins of government to a successor. Does that mean the crisis we have seen building there is really ending somewhat, or is there another crisis right behind it? Unfortunately, we're talking about two crises happening simultaneously. There's the security one of the Islamic State conquering more and more of Iraq pushing into Kurdistan and sort of continuing to push when people thought they couldn't push further. And there's the political crisis of a prime minister who is seen as so hardline, so pro-Shiite, that the allies he needs to fight the Islamic State, the Kurds and the Sunnis, simply wouldn't fight with him. Let's talk about so, the first one. We were told there were 40,000 refugees on that mountain and a couple of U.S. airstrikes, and it turns out maybe there were 4,000. What's right. the deal? So that's the question, and it hasn't been answered yet. Were the initial numbers wrong? In which case, something that was a key part of the case for this intervention that the White House used simply wasn't there? Or by some miracle, could you get 40,000 people or 80,000 people off a mountain in a matter of days? It didn't get much attention, but on Thursday, the United Nations released a report just as the White House was saying things are pretty much okay, saying things were terrible, describing mass starvation, describing lack of medicine. And it was harrowing reading, totally overshadowed by the news of the U.S. saying it's not that bad. Hmm. I mean, so is this... We know the situation perhaps is not as bad as it uh, looked a week ago. A week ago tomorrow when the President Obama stood on the south lawn of the White House to sort of announce this. But does this give him an out, do you think, to sort of say, okay, we're done here, it's not as bad as we thought, move on? Or is that not the case? It does. It gives him an out if he chooses to take it. He's getting a bit of pressure to ramp up the airstrikes against the Islamic State. Because absent the airstrikes continuing, there's no possibility that the Iraqi army will retake the land, the land that's been lost. So should he choose to want to withdraw? And it's clear he didn't want to do this in the first place. He does have a bit of an out. It, it's sort of a historic moment for him. It really is, in some ways, the question of his whole second term. Does he double up and continue in Iraq, go back in a way he didn't want to do? Or does he allow the formation of an independent state, controlled at least in part by a militant, violent group? We had an intelligence briefing yesterday in which it was talked about how the Islamic State is the best funded, best armed, best trained terror group in history. There's never been anything like it. We always talk al-Qaeda for obvious reasons. This group is seen as a bigger threat. Wow. You know, he, the American people have not wanted U.S. troops on the ground most anywhere. What does the polling say about going back into Iraq in full force? And where is Congress at this point on that? It's interesting. You, you begin to have, and it goes back to the strange bedfellows question from before, you have both the left and the right saying, come to us. You, the saying to the president, you can't simply do this without congressional approval, without debate. The polling is interesting because the polling simultaneously is people think the president's too weak on one hand, people want to do more to help refugees on the other, but they don't want to go into Iraq in any significant way. So it's kind of all over the place and you could see to a degree why the White House isn't really sure politically how to frame this or how to act with it. Well, let's listen to a little bit of the president's attempt to frame it and when he came out in Martha's Vineyard earlier this week and claimed the victory, but he also framed the, the, the remaining dilemma this way. We are urging Iraqis to come together to turn the tide against ISIL, above all by seizing the enormous opportunity of forming a new, inclusive government under the leadership of Prime Minister-designate Abadi. Uh, I had a chance to speak to Prime Minister-designate Abadi uh, a few days ago, uh, and he uh, spoke uh, about the need for the kind of inclusive government, uh, a government that speaks to all the people of Iraq, uh, that is needed right now. So, okay, let's talk about Prime Minister designate a body. Is the president putting all of his eggs in that basket, and, and is that even realistic? Well, there's one thing that was very interesting about those remarks. He said a lot of words. The one word he did not say was Maliki. Didn't mention his name at all. That was the clearest sign of the White House wanting him in the rearview mirror and wanting a body now in the driver's seat. They've made that clear for a little while they now. Have. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they have. Haider al Badi is an interesting man. He is from the same party as Maliki, the Dawa party. But Maliki's branch of it went to exile in Iran. And Abadi's party, his branch of it, went into exile in London. He speaks fluent English, works as an engineer, built part of the London Bridge spanning the river there. So his background is very, very different. He is popular with the Kurds. He's popular with the Sunni. You could see sort of why there's some optimism. But think about the task he has to confront. He has to rebuild a government, find a government that's capable of rebuilding an army, get that army to fight on behalf of that government, and then fight against, again, what is the best funded, best armed group in the history of terrorism. So I think it's their right to think that he's a different man, but to think that somehow miraculously he will fix every problem 
it's not a hope that's going to be fulfilled. Does this mean that the U.S. can use the Kurds almost as proxy fighters in this and arming them in a way that can hopefully undercut this well-financed terror organization and at the same time support this new political movement? Yeah, I mean, they're doing two things now with the Kurds that are interesting. One, they are arming them directly. The other is they're having the Kurds function as spotters, which means Kurdish troops go forward and say, strike this target in, in cooperation with the American Air Force. So they're trying to use the Kurds basically as a ground army so it's Kurdish boots on the ground and not American ones. How much, one, one last question about this, how much of the political dilemma in Iraq mirrors the political dilemma we have seen in Afghanistan in which we have had to basically knit that democracy or effort at democracy back together? You know, it's interesting because you would say about Afghanistan in the recent past, it was just Karzai and Kabul and the rest of the country was lawless. Iraq has a tradition of cohesiveness in part by force. So Maliki basically took a country that had a bit of a history of staying together and fractured it even further. And that's a change. That isn't the way Iraq had operated for most of its history. Okay. Well, we'll be watching to see if that happens then or if there's even hope of it happening. Finally, we're going to leaven things at the end of the, po of the week with a little bit of American politics. The always watchable relationship between Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama took another turn this week. We can't stop watching. That's when it was widely reported that in an interview with our Atlantic colleague Jeffrey Goldberg, Clinton basically stiff-armed the president on foreign policy. Just before he ordered airstrikes in Iraq, just before they were scheduled to see each other at a party on Martha's Vineyard. Smoke, fire, both, neither, Jeff? With the Clintons and the Obamas, I think it's all of the above. Uh, <laughs> definitely smoke, definitely fire. But for a minute, I thought I was like transported back to 2007. We covered that campaign that went forever uh, into, into 2008. And the differences between uh, President Obama and now former Secretary of State Hillary Rodham Clinton are still sort of similar and reminiscent of what they were then. But look, the, the, like yes, the likable enough debate. You're likable enough, Hillary. Yeah. Um, and he went on to lose that night in New Hampshire, but win the overall thing. But look, there's no question that Hillary Clinton is definitely trying to distance herself from the president, particularly on foreign policy. I mean, he, it is, for all the reasons we've talked about, it's the lowest approval ratings he's had on this. So that's not surprising. But the question, I guess, is timing. Was she really meaning to sort of poke her fingers in the eye? And specifically the thing that really irritated the people inside the White House, and I'm guessing the president, because they're usually reflective of this, she said, great nations need organizing principles, and don't do stupid stuff is not an organizing principle. Well, the uh, don't do stupid stuff is his kind of... Um, uh, catch-all message for our foreign policy has to be sort of well thought out. We can't do things, you know, like uh, invade a country, et cetera. Well, it prompted David Axelrod, the president's former advisor, to uh, weigh in on Twitter. And he's worked for Hillary Clinton before, though, too, so he doesn't usually um, jump into these things. He said, look, don't do stupid stuff means not invade Iraq. So he was basically calling her out. A couple hours later, she announced that she was going to apologize. So at the end of the day here, of course she's more hawkish than he is. That's always been the case going back to 07. Her advisors say she was not trying to um, sort of create trouble here, but she was definitely trying to uh, distinguish her own views from this in this very long and fascinating article in The Atlantic. Well, clearly the headline was damning, but right. was the story really as, as, was she really distancing herself as much from the president in the context of talking about uh, talking about not doing stupid stuff? Because she went on to say, we understand that stupid stuff is a political right. idea. It sounds like she almost of, built that in, but the headline still said what it said. Of course the headline said what it said. And it, of course, like they agree on, you know, much, much, much right. more than they disagree on. They're Democrats. They're from the same essential uh, wing of the party. You know, they're um, close friends, um, have become advisors and, and things, or she's definitely sort of an advisor to him. But uh, l look, I mean, I think that in a respect, we're looking for uh, things that separate them. But she didn't have to say that. I mean, it was it was very intentional, a lot of Obama people believe. And she is going to, this is just the first chapter of this. I mean, if she decides you know, to move ahead with this, we're going to see her sort of drawing distinctions. She'll have to. Jeff, does this all really matter in the long run? She hasn't even announced yet, for instance. Are she we going to be talking? Oh, that's right. <laughs> really? Oh. <laughs> right. Are we going to be talking about but this in three, four it's, months? It's a great point, Carrie. I mean, I think we're, uh, you know, there's 
slow political season, so I think people are looking for whatever daylight there is between the two of them. Most people assume that she's running for president. It would be much more surprising now if she's not. But you're right, we don't know yet. We don't know that at all. But I think it matters only in that, is she going to have to apologize after every time she tries to distance herself or distinguish herself from him? It's always the challenge uh, of running <laughs> after um, the party that you're in inherits the White House. It's not as easy to be a change election because you're saying, I want to change, but I still need to be sort of with that guy. So that's her challenge. You know, Jeff, the, the quasi-apology is always, it was an interview, if you listen to the whole thing, the headline is not as bad context. as it is. Context. context. Right. Yeah. She just wrote a 600-page bit of context. Why did she not put this kind of critique, if it's going to be important to her, into the book as opposed to a mid-August interview? Great question, because she had, uh, you know, and the book wasn't exactly chock full with other news. There certainly was room for this bit of a nugget or her exploring this. So it's a good question. I think, you know, I guess the most cynical view is maybe she's trying to sell books. So she's, so she's doing this interview in the summer to try and, um, and draw attention to it. But the book was not that reflective. It was more of just kind of a, a travel log, if you will. I mean, this was obviously an answer to a very um, a skilled journalist asking tough questions, important questions. So I think, uh, you know, but she adv her advisors sort of flagged the White House. Oh, this may be a problem. Um, she gave this interview to The Atlantic. It's coming out soon. So they sort of knew what they did. But I think it's just Everything that she has has done in this blitz of interviews, you know, including when she um, said to ABC's Diane Sawyer, "We were dead broke when we, um, I was leaving the uh, White House." It's not. I mean, some of the more revealing things are coming out in these series of interviews more than her book. I'm going to tell Goldberg you call them a skilled journalist, by the way. Indeed. You know, he'll hold that against you. But let me ask you this other question. I'm going to take, take. Let me go back to Al Gore, running for president, was vice president under Bill Clinton. He had to over time make a little distance between him and the president, and it caused bad feelings. There were, as you recall, so is this even doable, this idea of separating yourself out from the guy you worked it for? It cost bad feelings and maybe even cost him the election. I mean, he lost Tennessee that year, yeah. and he lost Arkansas. And it, and if he, I mean, at least in Bill Clinton's way of thinking, some of his advisors, if he had campaigned with him, it would have been sort of more helpful. So, but no, it's very, very difficult to distinguish himself. And just think if Vice President Biden runs. I mean, we, you know, we can't rule out that entirely. How will he distinguish himself? Well, that will be fun. That will all of this will be fun to watch. But you know, the soap opera never ends. So we'll be there for you. Thank you, everybody. We have to leave you a few minutes early again this week to give you the chance to support your local station. But if you're hungry for more, and we hope you are, our conversation will continue online. The Washington Week Webcast Extra streams live at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. Watch it now, or you can find it all week long at pbs.org slash Washington Week. Among other things, we'll talk about tonight's indictment of Texas Governor Rick Perry. Keep up with developments with me and Judy Woodruff on the PBS NewsHour, and we'll see you here next week on Washington Week. Good night. <laughs>